Hi everyone, my name is Shelby and I am an educator here with BEMP um, and I am going to be talking with you all a little bit about our monthly monitoring um, and what that entails. Um, so this is our BEMP Basics Monthly Monitoring Edition and this is for those of you who will be coming out into the Bosque with us to help collect our monthly data. Um, so let's get into how you all are going to be doing that um, and what data sets you're going to be collecting. The first thing we're going to do is just go over BEMP and what BEMP stands for. Um, so BEMP is the Bosque Ecosystem Monitoring Program. And what I want you to do is to use your worksheet um, and draw in there what you think each of these words means. Um, so pause the video here, draw what you think they mean, um, and then we'll move on. So I have some images here um, of what each word means to me and what I think that um, goes well with them. Um, so the bosque, it is a Spanish word for forest. It is not just any forest though, it is a forest that is next to a river. Um, and in this case, it is our Rio Grande River. And then we also have our ecosystem. So ecosystems consists of living things and non-living things um, that live together and rely on each other to survive. Monitoring is just watching or observing something, so I like using the binoculars for that one. Um, and you're also recording that information down. You're observing or monitoring something um, over a period of time. That could be weekly, it could be daily, it could be monthly, in this case is what we do, um, things like that. And then a program. BEMP works with tons of schools. We work with um, local schools in Albuquerque and also in the surrounding areas. We work with universities, we work with other organizations, other federal partners, um, just other community members, and all of us together makes a community. So why do we monitor the bosque in the first place? Um, take some time to answer this question on what you think, um, and then we will get into it. So here's some answers um, that I have come up with. Um, so just a few. So one is to learn about the health of the bosque to see what lives there, to see how it's changing, to learn about the history of the area, to make predictions about the future, and so much more. So if you listed something that wasn't on this list, that doesn't mean that it is wrong, it is just in addition to this. There are so many reasons why we would monitor, um, and really the uh, options are endless. So now let's get into our data sets. So we have 32 active sites along the um, middle Rio Grande Valley, and that is um, starting up at Santo Domingo Pueblo, north of Albuquerque, and then going all the way down to uh, Mesilla in Las Cruces. Um, and we have other sites spread out through um, Albuquerque, Las Lunas, um, Berlin, and even um, down south at the Bosque del Apache Wildlife Refuge. Um, so it's really cool that we have so many sites and we're actually collecting um, a bunch of different areas of the Bosque every single month. So when you go out, you're going to get a data sheet, and this is kind of what your data sheets will look like, and this is what the data sheets look like that we will also be using out in the Bosque. Um, so I'm going to go over what is on them, um, and I'm going to go over our um, three data sets which are listed on our, our data sheet here as well um, in more depth in a moment, um, but this will just give you an overview of what it looks like. So our monthly monitoring um, data sheet it includes our site name. So like I said, we have 32 sites uh, and each of those has their own name, so we want to know where this data came from. Um, so that is our um, site name. And then we also have uh, the date that is collected. Like I said, we have um, monthly data and we want to know which month that came from. We also have our data collected by. So in this case, if I were going out and collecting the data, I would write my name here. If you are the one that's going out and collecting the data, you would write your name here. Um, and that is just in case we have someone who's going over this list. If they have a question, they can just easily know who to contact about the um, data. And then our three main um, data sets on here is our groundwater monitoring, 
our precipitation monitoring, and our litter fall collections. So I'm going to get through each of these three, like I said, in more detail in just a moment. On the back side, you probably will have something that includes observations um, that you had seen during that day, and primarily other animals that you're seeing. Um, and this can help you track, especially if you're coming out every month, it can help you track um, maybe what animals you saw depending on the season. So like you might be able to see some birds one month and the, not the same birds the, another month. You could also see if you saw more porcupines one day or not another day, different things like that. Um, it's also just fun to keep track of what animals you see. And then we also include weather. And this is so that we can uh, kind of compare to our data. Um, if the weather is actively raining when we're collecting, we might make a note of that on our data sheet um, to let them know like, oh, um, our precipitation might be high that day because it was actively raining. Or it might have been skewed because we uh, messed with the rain gauge when we were collecting it. Um, so it's important to know what the weather was doing while we are collecting. This is what our uh, maps look like. Um, and what you will use to get around the site and um, familiar with our equipment. So on here we have our um, groundwater wells listed, our rain gauges listed, and also our litter fall tubs listed as well, plus a few other things. Um, but at each site we have five groundwater wells, ten litter fall tubs, and two rain gauges. So I want you to take a moment to look at this map and answer your math question uh, about the symbols for each thing. So go ahead and take a moment, look at this map, and answer those questions. So let's get into our um, data sets. So our first data set we're going to be looking at is our groundwater wells. So our groundwater wells, they look just like this. They have um, this pipe, this PVC pipe, that is sticking out of the ground. Um, and it goes way down below ground, and it has slits in it that allow water to move through it. And I'll show you a graphic in just a moment um, that looks more about that. And then we use this thing here, so it's this circular thing that has um, this measuring tape connected to it, and we'll drop that down into the well. It has a sensor on the bottom of it, so when it touches water, it'll send a signal up to our beeper, and then it'll beep. That's why we call it a beeper. Um, and then we'll get to know how much water is underground. So this is what our um, groundwater well looks like if you had a like cross section of the bosque. So we have a house here of someone maybe that lives next to the bosque. We have a ditch. We have a levee, which is a thing you might ride your bikes on or take a walk on um, next to the bosque. We have our trees in the bosque that have all of their roots coming down, our river, and then our bosque on the other side. So our groundwater wells are a big PVC pipe that goes underground about four meters. So water, um, there's water like the surface water in the ditch and in the river um, that live right on the surface or that, live, that um, stays right on the surface. But some of that sinks down into our soil um, and stays below ground. And so we're looking to see how much of that water is below ground. So these uh, groundwater wells go down about four meters. So four meters is kind of hard to um, conceptualize. So here's a tool that I like to use. So think about a Volkswagen bug, and that is about four meters long. So if you flip that vertically, that is how long or, or how far down um, our groundwater wells go below ground. And that is because um, the roots of cottonwoods go about three meters down. So we want to see if the cottonwoods have enough water um, available to them. Again, why do we care about groundwater in the first place? Here's a few pictures that might help you answer this question. So um, similarly to the previous photo, um, I have a picture of a tree here with all of its roots coming down. And then I also have a person drinking water here. So why do we care about groundwater? Our next data set is precipitation. And precipitation um, can be in many forms. It could be in the form of rain, uh, it could be in the form of snow, hail, um, and there's even more than that. Um, but this is what we use to measure them. It is this wedge-shaped plastic thing. It's really not super high-tech, which is cool. I'm sure there's a lot of math involved into making it, 
um, but for me I just have the gauge and that is what we read. Um, so there are these kind of wedge-shaped triangular things um, that catches water in them. And on there it has numbers um, that we are able to use to measure it. So we measure our precipitation in millimeters. And millimeters are super tiny. So at our sites, we have two rain gauges. Um, and our gauges are located in two different areas. One of them, called the canopy gauge, is located underneath some trees. And the other, called the open rain gauge, is located um, just out in the open, no trees above it, just clear skies. Um, and we do that so we can see how the vegetation, so like big trees and things like that, might affect um, the distribution of the water. Because as water is falling straight down, if it hits leaves, it'll get diverted somewhere else. So we can see the impact of um, the trees and what water gets directly below them or not. So this is what our rain gauges look like if you were to look at them head on, just like looking at straight in front of you. Um, so on the bottom we have a layer of water and then we have a layer of oil right above that and we have oil there to um, prevent evaporation if you were to put a cup of water out in um, just your backyard or really anywhere in albuquerque it will evaporate it's super dry here um, it just sucks up all of that moisture um, and that's the same thing that would happen with our rain gauge. It's since we're only collecting them monthly, each month we would go and there would be no water in it because it would have all evaporated. Um, so we add this oil in here as kind of a sealant since it is less dense than water. It just floats on top of it, but then creates a seal um, and that prevents any evaporation from happening. So I've included a scale here so we can kind of do a sample reading of it. So we only want to measure the water. And to do that, we're going to measure the line that is between the oil and the water. And that is our exact water line. So if I'm going through here and I'm seeing it is at about five and a half millimeters of water. And then if we were to add the oil to it, it is about six and a half meters, <clears throat> six and a half millimeters of um, total liquid in here but we only want this water number. So the five and a half is what we want. Again, why do we care about precipitation? Uh, and I've used the same image from before with the tree and the roots, and I've also included a farm field. So take a moment to answer this question. Our last data set is uh, litter fall. And this is what our litter fall tubs look like. They are just these big black bins and they collect any plant material that falls um, from the plants above it. We'll get into this picture in just a moment of why uh, my coworker here, Matt, uh, is holding a fish. I'll show you in just a moment. So at each site, we have 10 litter fall tubs and they are labeled A through J. Um, every site has 10 of them. So what might fall into a litter fall tub? We could have different leaves, we could have branches, some fruits, some seeds. There might be bugs that fall in it or other animals, uh, might be shoes. Really anything you could think of has probably gone into these litter fall tubs. But what we're primarily looking for is our um, plant material. So our leaves, our branches, our fruits, seeds, things like that. And um, kind of on the category of things that fall into our litter fall tubs and don't mean to go into our litter fall tubs is that first picture that I showed you here um, with Matt holding this fish. So this is one of our sites that had flooded quite a few years ago. Um, so these fish came in from the river and then the water level dropped, but the tub held water in it still and there was a fish in there. So our fish got caught in our litter fall tubs. So sometimes even fish fall into our litter fall tubs. Um, but again, we're only looking at plant material for our litter fall. And the way that we collect it is super high tech and involves a lot of materials. Um, we are using a brown paper bag um, to collect our litter fall. So we have our brown paper bag. What we would do is just scoop out all the leaves, the seeds, the fruits, plant material that has fallen in and just put it right on in our um, paper bag. 
And on our paper bag, we have the site name. So in this case, it says Bosque Farms because that's the map we were looking at. We would also have the date. Um, and like I said, we have 32 sites, so that's a lot of bags of litter fall. Um, so we need to know when they were collected. And also we have the tub. So each tub gets its own bag. So we have letters A through J of tubs um, and on our bags, we would also label them A through J as well um, to collect our bags. But when you think about a bag, a uh, paper bag, it's only maybe a foot tall, few inches wide. It's not a really large thing. Um, and sometimes there are very large branches that fall down from trees and land in our litter fall tubs. So what if the branch is bigger than the tub? What would we do in that case? So here's a picture of where a branch had fallen over a litter fall tub. And you can see it's much wider than the um, tub. And also it definitely will not fit in our bag. So what we would do is we would cut it um, exactly where it goes over the tub. What we're imagining is like a force field coming up from the litter fall tub and we would collect all of the uh, material above in that force field. So in this case we can either snap it with our hands um, exactly where it crosses into the tub or if it is too large for us to snap with our hands we could either bring a saw with us or come out like um, a day later and use that saw and saw where the um, wood has crossed the tub. Write the same information on there, like the site, the date, and which tub it was at, and then take that with us when we're bringing all of our materials back um, to the university. So again, why do we care about litter fall in the first place? Here are some pictures that might help you with your answer. We have one picture that includes a bunch of different kinds of leaves. We also have um, some a tree here that's going through multiple seasons. So we have spring, summer, fall, and winter time here, and it's showing you what it is doing. Um, so that's those are two hints for why we care about the um, litter fall that we're collecting. So now that we've collected all this data, I have 10 litter fall bags filled with uh, leaves and maybe some sticks and fruits or seeds, all of those things. I have 10 bags full of them. And then I also have this data sheet that is filled with information on precipitation and also information on our wells. So just like we had our beeper going down, we measured how much water is below us. I have all that information. That's cool for myself, but what do we do with it then? Um, so all of this information goes to the university where we have a lab there and we also have staff that works at the university and what they do is they go through and input all of this information into different um, larger data sheets that have all of our sites and over multiple years on them. And then we also have people go through our litter fall. So they'll um, section out the plants that have um, fallen by like leaves or by fruits or seeds, things like that. And they'll measure how much is at um, or how much there is for each type of plant um, and then input that information into those big data sheets as well. Um, and then that information uh, can be used by a lot of different kinds of people. Um, some of them can be or that information can be used by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, other federal partners, other state partners. Um, that can look at our data and analyze it and see what's happening with our bosque and then make decisions on um, maybe some restoration that needs to be done in our bosque or other ways that we can help um, the bosque in general. Um, so the data that you all are going to be collecting is very valuable data and is real data that is used um, by other scientists in the area. So by you collecting this, you are community scientists um, and then other scientists look through the data and make those big restoration decisions um, that happen on the bosque. Um, so it's really cool and we really appreciate you helping us out in the bosque and collecting our information because we have so much of it to collect every month that you all are very valuable um, to us and to the health of our bosque. So with that, I am going to leave you all. I hope you all get out into the bosque and are able to collect some information with us. Um, thank you so much, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.